Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, uh, this is uh, Socialist Majority Caucus presents a conversation with Margot Okazawa Ray and Max Elbaum. My name is Beth Wong. I'm a member of, of the Democratic Socialists mm -hmm. of America and joined in 2016. Uh, I'm coming. Uh, to see you from Boston. Uh, I am a member of the Socialist Majority Caucus. It's a caucus of the Democratic Socialists of America, uh, which is the largest socialist organization in the United States. Uh, as a caucus within DSA, we are unifying behind a couple of key principles. Uh, the first being that it is our urgent task to build a socialist majority. The second is that we are organizing the working class around immediate and radical demands uh, as our pathway to power. Uh, that feels more important than ever these days. Uh, our third principle is that uh, we believe that effective and well-targeted campaigns around the civic demands are at the heart of DSA's political work and that DSA should embrace a democratic bottom-up model of campaign development that connects local struggles with broader demands. We strongly believe that dismantling racist and oppressive institutions is central to our fight and that socialist feminist practice informs our organizing and organizational culture. I'm so pleased to introduce our two movement elders today uh, as we reflect uh, on this particular uh, political moment. Uh, uh, we are so thrilled to be joined by Margo Okazawa Ray, who is a founding member of the Kumbahi River Collective and a transnational feminist scholar. She is a professor emerita at San Francisco State University. Um, our second movement elder is Max Elbaum, who is the author of Revolution in the Air, a detailed account of the successes, failures, and lessons from the new communist movement, and is currently an editor at the Organizing Upgrade, one of my favorite blogs. Uh, and so we're so thrilled that Margot and Max are joining us tonight to share their important perspectives on organizing in this moment, specifically how to how to continue to build left movements for power and how to promote narratives of anti-racist solidarity and, in, and interrupt anti-Asian uh, American violence and rhetoric in this particular moment. So we're so glad um, that you can join us tonight. And we're so glad to have this uh, conversation, which is the first in a series uh, with movement elders. Uh, so thank you for joining us, Margo and Max. Um, you know, this is such a... Uh, particular moment in uh, in uh, in history and uh, and uh, just between uh, you know Bernie Sanders dropping out of the uh, Democratic primary yesterday and the, and this rise of uh, COVID nineteen that has up that has upended so many of our lives. Uh, this is really just a. Uh, a uh, very particular moment, and this crisis has exposed how racial capitalism has rendered our livelihoods so precarious and our lives so fragile. Uh, so we're really hoping uh, to, uh, as we reflect on this moment, we're uh, hoping for your perspectives. And just so first, uh, what do you two make of this moment? Go ahead, Matt. Right. <laughs> okay, Margo asked me to go first. Uh, well, the first thing to say is that um, it's been a few very rough days. So Bernie has dropped out. Uh, and uh, in Beth and my home state of Wisconsin, uh, we just saw Jim Crow in action. Uh, it's pretty striking for people my age. People have to risk their life to go out and vote. And this is against the backdrop of a global pandemic that is, with its differential impact, uh, is affecting everybody all over the world and exposing all the pre-existing injustices and inequalities and exacerbating every one of them. So it's a, it's a rough time in the most immediate sense, and uh, it's one of the reasons I'm very grateful for this conversation. Uh, these are the kinds of things that help us keep our balance and find our way uh, and bring us closer together to the community that will have to struggle so that we come out stronger on the other side. Uh, as far as this moment, 
Uh, you know, it's become trite to say a crisis is a time of uh, both danger and opportunity, but it's trite because it's true, and it's never been more true than it is right now. Uh, this is a period of incredible instability, incredible inequality, incredible polarization. This is a center cannot hold moment. This is a no going back moment. Uh, this country and humanity is facing uh, a fork in the road where it can accelerate toward a very dystopian future or can start on an uncharted path towards some kind of radical change for the better. And I'm just going to say a few things of uh, the backdrop of how I think we got here. Uh, and one could start in 1619, one could start in 1860, but I'm just going to start in 2008 because we only have an hour. <laughs> uh, the 2008 financial crisis, the bailout of the banks and the people who caused that crisis while leaving the middle class, the working class, people of color, the most vulnerable to fend for themselves exposed and exacerbated all the problems in the neoliberal model that had dominated the world since Thatcher and Reagan in the early 80s. Uh, the U.S. inability to win its wars had developed, a, you know, now the term is endless wars, further discredited the elite and exacerbated the sense of hardship, instability, and anxiety, and the need for change of one direction or another. The climate crisis, the crisis of climate change hung over everything. And above all, in terms of the polarization in U.S. politics, I think which isn't often given as much attention as the issue of demographic change and the fact that this country is slowly becoming a much higher percentage of people of color and in 20 years or 40 years would be a people of color majority country. And that gradual change was thrust right into the forefront of national consciousness by the election of the first black president. And so on the progressive side of the spectrum, all these things led to certain kinds of optimism about the future, that the demographics might be working in our favor, that there was greater possibility for social movements and so on. And that was true. And that's our antecedents in Black Lives Matter and Occupy and so on. But that was not the dominant force with initiative in the period after 2008. Rather, those forces who wanted to defend the system, who saw the problems of them, to them, what was a problem of, uh, they saw demographic change as a problem and as an existential threat. The decline of U.S. power in the world and the changing composition of this country, even if represented by someone with a moderate program like Obama, was seen as an existential threat to the identity of to a, their identity of a white supremacist imperial country, uh, and what that led to was an intensification of what had already been going on since Nixon's Southern strategy in the late 1960s, of a backlash against all the gains of the civil rights movement, the anti-war movement, the women's movement, the LGBTQ movement, and even going back further against the gains of the New Deal. Uh, and it led to the capture of the one of the two major political parties by white nationalism, the center of gravity of the GOP. After a brief resistance from the Republican Party establishment, they decided it was in their interests to cut a deal with the right wing populists and allow Trump and Trumpism to foreground and make explicit and blatant a program that was headed for what I call a racialized authoritarian state. And the glue holding together that coalition was white supremacy, even though the driving force of it is the fossil fuel industry, the right wing billionaires, the military industrial complex, and some of the most reactionary sectors of capital. They've roped in large proportion of this country based upon what historically has been 
the front to defend reaction, which is based the glue of white supremacy. And that led after Trump's election, which is a, was a surprise to people across the political spectrum, uh, the most intense polarization in this country since the Civil War. Because racial polarization overlapped almost completely with partisan political polarization, with geographic separation, and even with basic information polarization, where people not only got their interpretations of what was going on in the world from different sources, but even their basic facts about what was happening in the world. And within that polarization, uh, there was one camp, the Trump camp, that was more unified and more homogeneous, headed for a racialized authoritarian state. And opposed to Trump and Trumpism was a much more diverse, heterogeneous, sociologically and politically anti-Trump bloc. And what we've seen in the last year, the last two years and since Trump's inauguration is two important struggles. One struggle is a struggle between the Trumpist agenda and all the anti-Trump forces. And the other is an important struggle within the anti-Trump camp whose highlight and pivot was Bernie's campaign versus the camp, Bernie's campaign, Elizabeth Warren's campaign versus the campaigns of the so-called center lane moderates, corporate Democrats. And those two struggles and the way they interrelated with each other and the positioning of the left within them and our tasks in relationship to that, that set the context for where we are today. And I'm gonna stop there. I'm sure there'll be a lot of discussion about the electoral side, what happened and so on, but let me just leave it at that for openers. Yeah, thanks, Max. Thanks for that great analysis. Go ahead, Margo. Yeah, thank you so much, Max, for uh, giving us the background. Um, when I was thinking about this conversation, um, I was wondering, where do we start the story? And so, Max, you started at 2008, and, you know, you gave a great kind of a materialist analysis here and anti-racism and all of those things. And uh, I'm going to start in a slightly different place, which is by saying that What's happening now is, as the saying goes, as American as apple pie, right? Um, and um, it didn't, in my opinion, um, uh, start in this, you know, uh, with Trump or, you know, there were lines of presidents and politicians and, you know, all those folks before now. And um, Max, you remember this. I don't know if other folks remember this. When Reagan was in office, the Democrats controlled both the House and the Senate. And Reagan got basically what he wanted and more, right? And so, you know, what was exciting about Bernie's campaign was that, you know, it really challenged both parties and just kind of went, went beyond that. Um, I'm also thinking about, you know, uh, these things in... Um, in, a, in a, a very kind of philosophical way as well, and thinking about these things in a values way. Uh, we talk about demographics, right? Yes, the demographics have changed. But I also need to, uh, we need to think in layers so that everybody on this call knows it's not just about the bodies, right? But what are the politics that um, groups and individuals are espousing? are struggling, what are the values um, uh, that, that they're operating out of, you know, and all of that. And can we galvanize, you know, a movement where we can both understand the importance of demographics, but understand more deeply the, 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 the ways that ideology and values function to shape not just our political perspectives, but our relational practices, right? So that so much for me as a feminist at this particular, you know, um, political moment is how do we um, think about race? And, and a lot of people in these seminars have talked a lot about race 
and um, something about class, you know, kind of uh, in, 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 in some way. But very few people are talking about gender and the ways that all these uh, impacts are differentially experienced, also based on gender, right? And so I want us to think about that centrally uh, in this moment. And um, as you've you know, heard from other seminars and you all know yourselves, um, we have to think not just about race and class, but we also have to think about gender we also really have to think about what it means to be connected to the U.S. state and the U.S. corporations, right? Because otherwise we end up kind of, of um, you know, um, trundling along as we have in this kind of U.S. Ex or American exceptionalism, right? And that somehow what we're experiencing is so horrible and, and it is, right? I'm not you know, un, you know, um, saying it's not horrible, but let's put it in perspective, right? Um, if you talk to folks in the Philippines, for example, you know, you'll hear stories of how there's a curfew, they have to have permits, um, only um, one person in the household can go out, um, and only, strictly speaking, for food and um, uh, you know, help kinds of things. Um, and then there's the whole militarism piece that hasn't really been talked about and lifted up very much. Uh, and I'll just say for folks on this call, be on the lookout for that because we're going to be doing uh, uh, COVID and militarism. So anyway, what I'm suggesting here along with Max is that there are layers that I think it's really important for us to kind of peel back and see how the layers, um, the, the, the ways in which the layers, certain layers go all the way back, you know, before the founding of this country, right? And then other layers are more, um, are, are much closer to 2020 in this moment of, of COVID. So um, having said that, I think I know from all my contacts around the world that this is a fantastic moment. Uh, and the, the moment isn't just material. So I'll leave it here um, for now and come back. Great, and we are so, so glad that you are with us to help us process this extraordinary moment. Uh, and I think that uh, both of you, or uh, I want to uh, ask a question that builds off of uh, the point about militarism and, and COVID and to think about the uh, more internationalist perspective. I think part of what, uh, to me, the promise of a Bernie Sanders presidency was to change um, the U.S. position towards Israel and Palestine. Uh, he feels like the only uh, presidential candidate, in, at least in my short lifetime, that uh, we that I would felt confident was not going to invade a foreign country to uh, to bolster U.S. corporate interests, uh, or was not going to be tricked by the foreign policy establishment into into doing that. Um, and so, both of you are longtime movement activists in the fight against uh, racial capitalism and U.S. imperialism. Uh, I, from my uh, experience in DSA, it does seem like internationalism has been. Uh, a weakness of the contemporary U.S. left, uh, and that's somewhat ironic and very unfortunate as we all confront a global pandemic. Um, from your perspective, um, how can organizations like DSA build a broader political analysis in this particular moment to foster greater global solidarity? Over to you, Max. <laughs> Uh, to the gentleman well, on the I, other side of the aisle. No, I, I think one of I think one of the reasons why uh, I think there's two reasons why the international solidarity and international perspective side uh, has been probably the weakest part of the anti-Trump uh, front. There, there, and I want to pick up on what Margot said about layers. There, there's different layers of that. One layer is the uh, long time, long standing provincialism of the United States 
and national chauvinism that this is the center of the world. And that goes back a long, long way. And again, in, in terms of the, the layers. Um, the history has been that extremely large and militant anti-war movements have come about when large numbers of US troops have been deployed abroad and are taking casualties. That's been the heights of the anti-war movements in US history. So it becomes, uh, it, it's not the normal that there is an internationalist sentiment in the United States. That's the unusual. And we shouldn't, we have to look and switch that normal. So internationalism becomes uh, the norm. Um, the second layer is that for uh, Margot's and my generation, there was a, or seemed to be a, a, a game where if the US lost, revolutionary forces of the left would gain. And there was a counter system, and a, now there were all kinds of debates about the Soviet Union, China, Cuba, et cetera. But by and large, there was a progressive international that existed, a counter system that confronted US imperialism. So there were good guys. There were a lot of good guys out there. And a big impetus and inspiration for our generation was those revolutionary movements, Cabral, Che, uh, different people had different heroes or movements, uh, but they were inspiring. Uh, that world has changed. That world has changed in the late 90s. And it's no longer the case that people are see where there is a pole in the world that seems to be this is the revolutionary future. And we, and that's made it more confusing for people. It's made it more difficult because we need to switch our paradigm from we're supporting another revolutionary party that we think is the vanguard or something around the world toward a people to people anti-militarist notion that depends upon it's other people's right to run their own affairs. And the US has no business meddling, even if they're meddling against another force that we don't particularly like that much. We have to get off the rest of the world's back. And there's gonna be a lot of people to people ties. And I want a, a shout out to Margo and some of the networks, the networks against militarism have paved a different paradigm for internationalism that's more attuned to the current moment and the current landscape in the world. There's gonna be a lot of people to people solidarity and there's uh, gonna be a lot of uh, less, uh, you know, choose your party that's you're going to be in solidarity with. There has to be a different frame. And, and, and uh, the, the last thing I'll say about this is uh, one of the strengths of the movements that we came out of was we felt uh, that we had things to learn from people in the global south, not just to teach. Uh, and I think that's an important perspective in a country where we keep being bombarded, that we're the most advanced. And that seeps into the left, that somehow we can tell other people what to do. Our experience is advanced. It's not true. Uh, we may have some things where that are advanced to teach other people, but we have plenty to learn from social movements in Brazil, Venezuela, uh, across the Pacific region, the Middle East, uh, you name it, Africa, uh, we have a lot to learn from those movements. And that spirit has to infuse where we're going. Yeah, and, you know, uh, Max, I'm glad you're, um, uh, you ended your comments by talking about learning. And I think, you know, this idea of who's learning from whom is an important question, particularly people, you know, uh, uh, like us in the global north, uh, particularly in the U.S., and I think it's also, uh, there's also a kind of a shift needed so that we are constructing new knowledges together, right? That new ways to understand uh, contemporary situations 
new ways to think about history um, that we can do together so that both using history, using the current moment, we together are figuring out how to understand, for example, power and the way it's operating now and its, its antecedents, or its, is it antecedents? Precedents, right? Um, uh, and, 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 and that's one of those moments, I think, you know, because let's say that a lot of the things that we've done, you know, and some of the methods, they have been tried and true in the past, but I think this is a, it's time for building on the things uh, that have worked in some ways, but more important, uh, building relationships, learning opportunities so that we can co-construct new ways of understanding, new ways of doing things, right? And some of the new will probably go back to traditional ways Right, it's well. I think we're coming full circle in that sense too. So that recognizing that some of the indigenous ways of knowing, traditional cultural practices, are particularly relevant, or they may be even more relevant relevant than they have, or at least we thought they they have been in the past. Um, there's one other thing, and I have learned a lot from the the transnational feminist movement. And I think there was a way in which our movement was able to go beyond states, for example, particularly around this question of violence against women, which is a universal phenomenon, right? Played out differently in different locations. Patriarchy looks different in different locations, right? Um, but being together in those movements just around that issue, I think has taught us a lot. One of the things that's taught feminists in the US, uh, and I think we need to, to learn this better, right, is that um, we have to both rely on and not rely on the state. Because in some locations where there isn't, where there, uh, there are multiple legal regimes, for example, customary uh, laws, uh, ecclesiastical or religious, I'll say religious laws, um, and then, you know, the state um, constitutions and so forth, when there are those multiple regimes, the women have no place to stand, right? So it relies on the state to some extent. Having said that, we can't just rely on the state. So there's this kind of attention, right? So that's one of the things that I've learned is how do we think about the state? How do we think about um, community people's agency uh, and um, in a way that can can pull together and galvanize power in ways that perhaps we hadn't thought about. So I'll just leave it at that for now. Uh, if I can throw in one more thing on the uh, theme about learning. Uh, there are other DSA can partner with and learn from many other groups in the United States that have been plugging away at this for a while. Mm -hmm. So you have groups like Grassroots Global Justice. I see Cindy Weisner, Weisner's on this call. Uh, mm -hmm. He has a lot of experience and on the feminist side as well as on the global solidarity side in general. Uh, there's groups in the African community here in the Bay Area where I'm located. There's a network, Third World Resistance, that brings together the Arab Resource Center, the Filipino uh, solidarity groups, uh, groups uh, working around Korea. Uh, uh, you know, there's a whole range of other groups that have some advanced experience here that I think DSA uh, d is not limited to the resources you have and the knowledge base you have within DSA uh, and those partnerships and learning from those other groups experience, they have a lot to contribute. And uh, I think that can be a way that DSA can access some experiences over the last five, 10, 20 years um, to help the organization develop further. Absolutely. And there were so many uh, longtime uh, movement activists 
who were involved in the new communist movement who founded so many organizations. There are so many social movement-based building groups in Boston uh, that celebrated 40th or 45th anniversaries in the past couple of years, and those were exactly mass organizations that uh, committed socialist organizers uh, uh, conducted their their math work through, and we have so much to learn. Uh, I know that I, in particular, am so lucky to be in the orbit of the Chinese Progressive Association, which turned 42 years ago, mm-hmm. uh, which has been an anchor of uh, progressive uh, multiracial politics, at least in greater Boston and along the East Coast. And so speaking as a, as a Chinese American, I have been uh, nervous since about January that the right that the right-wing uh, white nationalists uh, in the Trump administration would likely blame the spread of COVID-19 on China, which for many Americans is totally indistinguishable from Chinese people in the U.S. Uh, so the news of anti-Asian xenophobia uh, leading to physical violence has been very disturbing to me and many, pe- many people of all races on the left. Um, how do you think that DSA uh, and and leftist organizations uh, can organize against anti-Asian xenophobia? And what do you think have been some effective strategies that socialist organizations have used in the past to stand up to racialized violence? Marco, you want to go first on this time? Well, let me say this. Um, I've been in several conversations lately. And um, I wonder if there's a way in which in facing this anti-Asian violence, which is really serious, you know, I think there are over a thousand, I don't know, nearly 2,000 reported incidents. Um, and we probably know many of the uh, most extreme examples on this call. I wonder if there's a way that we can take both the particulars of the anti-Asian violence, right, and understand it and organize around it in such a way that we look both at the white supremacists, you know, the the direct um, perpetrators, and probably it's not just white people, who are who are being uh, anti-Asian too, right? And so, looking at the particulars, and then using this moment to protect the ones you know who are being targeted and hurt and so forth, and at the same time, look at the ways in which the construction of race, the black-white, the dominant black-white racial paradigm, also kind of helps us keeps us from seeing things that we ought to be seeing from a bigger frame, right? So that historically the black white racial paradigm has said other racial groups matter less, right? And I think there's a kind of a, some anti-Asian kind of leaning sentiment within that. Having said that, they're also among Asians and Asian immigrants and Asian Americans, kind of anti-blackness and, you know, anti-brown folk, you know, and all of that. So I'm just wondering, what can we learn? What have we we learned from the past around this kind of racialized scapegoating, racialized violence that we can take to deal with the particulars of the anti-Asian stuff at the same time deal with the intra-racial dynamics so that none of us will have to put up with this kind of scapegoating and, and hatred, depending on what, what, when the context changes, right? And everybody who knows this country knows that there has to be an N, I won't use the word, on the bottom. There's been particular groups on the bottom, but it could be anybody, right? It could be any group of color, depending on you know what's happened. If we look beyond the history of it, right? And so just for example, immigrant groups know that, um, uh, you know, so just, I'm getting too far ahead of myself. So I think in this moment, there's this tension, this kind of um, 
pulling back one of the layers, right? This tension between Asian and Asian Americans as a model minority. And then we've known throughout history that when needed, they don't be, they're no longer models, right? They are the targeted people. We talk about the Exclusion Act, uh, the Chinese Exclusion Act, you know, all of those things, right? And so how do Asians and Asian Americans need to think about their own social location, their own place in this society? How do, how do we need to think about deep racial solidarity in this moment? And finally, how do we need to examine ourselves uh, to think about where are the little things that, you know, um, I didn't even know what to call it, things. The, the, the ethnocentrism, the racism that we're also um, harboring against, you know, other peoples of color. So I think the moment now is to deal both with the particular anti-Asian stuff and to imagine what a real racial solidarity would look like and how would it be practiced among peoples of color and then eventually white folks. Uh, Maybe not even eventually white folks, white folks now, you know? Well, uh, first, amen to all of that. Uh, second, uh, this is an issue where it shows that there isn't a border between the domestic and international dimensions of our yeah. struggle. Uh, the blame China line is not only responsible for the violence against Asian Americans in the United States, it's a buildup toward confrontation with China mm -hmm. and the danger of military action. China is now seen as the global peer competitor. Uh, and on, there, on this, there is very little difference of opinion between the different parties. On many other foreign policy issues like Iran, there actually is a big division between the strategy that the Democrats and the strategy that the Republicans, but pretty much the U.S. ruling class overall is united on confronting China in the next few decades in the battle for hegemony. So this is both a domestic and international issue. Yeah. On the specifics of the anti-Asian violence, I think we have a lot to learn from what happened, um, the Muslim ban and the uh, violence against uh, Islam, uh, people, people who are Muslim. And we also have experiences during the 80s when uh, there was a big scare that the Japanese auto industry was going to ruin the American auto industry. There was a murder of a Chinese American named Vincent Chin. Um, because again, uh, the people who killed them couldn't tell the difference between a Japanese American and a Chinese American. And there was a whole national struggle using the Vincent Chin case to raise up the problem of anti-Asian violence and was the spearhead of the fight back of the, against anti-Asian violence in that period. I think actually that's where the origins of the Committee Against Anti-Asian Violence in New York have, which became a very important community organizing organization in New York. So there's people there. Um, I think Ai Jin Poo, who's now the head of uh, the domestic workers, came out of CAF ultimately. So there, there's a lot there. And one of the things is physical accompaniment. And uh, you show up. Uh, when something happens, you shine a spotlight on it. People call a press conference. You make demands on the, on the state and the police to protect and to go after the white supremacists um, and the uh, paramilitaries and all these different kinds of hate groups. Uh, and people have to show up and you do United Press conferences. Uh, during the, um, after 9-11, people went to mosques and stood guard. Now, this is tricky in the period of this pandemic, but I think there are ways people are finding some creative ways with car demonstrations, with various ways to physically um, deal with things. So it, it, this is a way where uh, DSA brings a lot of people power in different places, and that people power can show up and really make a difference and uh, raise the voice against it in a very practical way. Mm -hmm. And I want to just add one more thing here, Max, to what you're saying is uh, what you said earlier, actually, that, you know, um, 
there's a great polar polarization right now, right? Also, having said that, there are also a lot of bystanders, right? People kind of just sitting back, standing, whatever they're doing, but not necessarily part of the po the polls. And so it seems to me that with DSA breadth that um, you all have, you know, maybe one of the strategies is to pull in the bystanders, you know, and have them become engaged somehow uh, on our side, as it were, right? Because as Paulo Freire said, you know, in these um, situations of structural inequalities, there's no such thing as standing by or neutrality is the word he used, right? If you're neutral, you're on you're on the side of, on uh, on the wrong side from my perspective, and so how do we engage bystanders? Bystanders in in the struggle, uh, I think, is an important question too. That's a great great point. I think that we have so much uh, to do to bring to change the common sense and bring in the bystanders. Uh, so that we can, uh, as Margot has put it, peel back the layers and uh, and then as uh, uh, and get people to show up to show their solidarity uh, to show how uh, there isn't this this hard distinction between what's happening in our country and what's happening around the world. Um, and especially in these times where our when our realities are changing and shifting uh, weekly, sometimes daily, it's more important than ever to help people make meaning of what's happening around the world right now. Uh, and I think that um, I think to uh, your previous points uh, for from both of you, uh, this is a great moment of uncertainty, of instability, where the center is not holding, uh, where it seems like divergent worlds could could happen. Uh, and I think that we need to use this moment of uncertainty and changing hegemony to end racial oppression and class exploitation. Uh, so what are some of the most important actions that you think uh, DSA or committed activists in uh, the Socialist Majority Caucus can take at this particular moment, uh, perhaps to pull in the bystanders to galvanize the, to galvanize the larger public and more? Can I just um, just just be a little bit specific with um, mm -hmm. um, two things you said. One is that um, the point is that um, what's happened. There's a continuity of what's happening between quote home here and there, right? And that a lot of what's happening there is the result of what's happening. The policies in the of the U.S. government, military, corporations, right? So that's really important um, to keep, really keep, keep, keep this in mind. The other is, you know, there's been a lot of talk about um, uncertainty, precarity, all of that. That's very specific to people like us, right? And if you look at the rest of many parts of the globe and within the, the global south, within the global north, right, precarity, precariousness, uncertainty, our way of life. And I think we just really need to be more nuanced when we say we, who are the we who are not used to uncertainty, right? Who are used to being in control or having control or thinking at least we're in control. So I just want to, you know, just clarify that a little bit, at least from how I understand things. Um, and then we can answer your question. <laughs> Go ahead, Max. Uh, I think there's three uh, three levels of things happening right now in the pandemic. Uh, the first one is meeting the immediate survival needs of the population that is hit so hard by the pandemic and its ripple effects economically on the workforce and so on. So people are uh, huge, millions of people are worried about not five years from now, but two weeks from now. Are they gonna have a roof? Can they get a roof if they don't have one? Can they find shelter, food? What about their families? All of that. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are struggles breaking out, some of which have organizers connected to them 
and many of which are spontaneous, people who've never participated in politics. So there's a whole range of struggles on that level that include some mutual aid things, not ones that are just like we're going to go off and save ourselves, but are people banding together to take care of one another, people uh, walking out of a McDonald's, people going on a rent strike where they are, uh, prisoners, disabled people, uh, all the inequalities in the most vulnerable sectors. This is all going on. So one thing is to connect with those. People connecting with those and being there with others as they struggle. Mm -hmm. That then gets connected to what I think is the next level, which is the struggle to understand why the pandemic is having the effect it has and how that translates into American politics. So that's the struggle over the narrative. Is it the China virus or is it the problem that this country does not have a decent public health system, does not have the kind of system where if people lose their jobs, they're protected until the economy recovers, all exacerbated by the eight weeks that Trump administration stonewalled and did absolutely nothing to, to take precautions. The United States is number one in the worst handling of this crisis relative to its wealth of any country in the world. That's what number one is. So that level is a battle over narrative and it's a battle over protecting the election. It's a battle over engaging people in that level of politics. And then the third level is our visionary demands for a very thorough restructuring, uh, going back to the first things that Margot said about the structures of this country and the deep layers of inequality and racial capitalism, gendered capitalism, and all the other things that are interconnected. Okay. The strategic trick is to bridge those layers. Um, how do you engage in the first and keep a connection to the battle over the narrative and politics and to long range structural change. Bernie's done a good job, I think on that, but his voice will be a little muted now that he's dropped out. Uh, I wrote my last column for organizing upgrade about the people's bailout initiative, which has five principles which provide a bridge between those immediate struggles. And now I think 800 organizations have signed on to those principles, all the way from uh, groups like the Indigenous Environmental Network, which is one of the initiators, all the way to daily costs, move on. So there's a broad front around that. Uh, the Wisconsin situation has created an a wake up call for people about voter protection, voting rights. Uh, Stacey Abrams has been in on that. There's a whole range of grassroots groups. So I think linking those levels and DSA, again, uh, you have a, a, such a large organization, people looking for things to do, a highly motivated membership. And many people in DSA are more flexible in what they can do in their political work right now than a lot of other folks. So they're in a situation like this, an organization has to be nimble. You can't just keep doing what you were doing before. You have to be willing to shift around priorities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks, Max. I absolutely agree. And um, I want to just add a couple of things. One thing is, just like America, the whole idea of American exceptionalism, right? Social policy in this country operates out of an exceptional framework. Right. So all the social policies, there's not one universal policy in this country, not one. Right. You get medic, um, uh, you get Social Security because you put money into it. Right. You get financial aid because your uh, family income is not, you know, not enough. So a really important um, framework for restructuring is putting in the value of universal, right? With obviously dealing specifically with specific people, but this idea of universal uh, health, you know, universal education, all those things. I think that has to be part of the restructuring. I think the other thing that needs to happen along with everything that Max said, this is a, a 
piece for us, right? People in the movement, people who really want to try to uh, restructure, create a, uh, a different world. And one is really thinking about what are we actually trying to create? What is our vision of a just and sustainable community, society, you know, global, kind of a global vision, right? How do we, how do we arrive at that, right? What are the principles that must be part of that vision of a, of a new society? I'll just put that in quotes, right? But you get the idea. And then I think the other thing is what kind of people must we become to be able to actually live in it without reproducing the same old crap that we've been operating out of, right? In other words, how do we do individually and as groups, how do we do the necessary transformative work for ourselves as we're doing the organizing? Because I think many people in this conversation have seen progressive X, you know, post-colonial country, et cetera, just end up reproducing. Partly it's structural, Partly, it's also because we haven't really changed our consciousness, changed our relational practices. We still, in the, particularly in the U.S., are hyper-individualistic, even though we call ourselves collectives, we call ourselves socialists, right? And so, you know, I want us to be self-critical in that way as well. And as we're doing the material organizing, right, really think about, how will this organizing help us become more human, right? And how will this organizing help us get it from the depths of our soul and from the bottoms of our hearts that our, our destinies are bound up together, that we share a common destiny, right? Um, so the work is twofold, right? Definitely material, all those things, Max, that are so important, they're critical, right? And I just want to put, you know, really encourage us to think about our own kind of transformation uh, as we're doing the work so that we can actually be in the place where we're trying to create without messing it up. Wow, uh, what powerful uh, notes to end on. Well, I really want to thank both of you, Margo and Max, so, so much uh, for joining us. Uh, for sharing your wisdom uh, and uh, how to help make meaning uh, and provide context for these uh, for these very extraordinary times. Uh, so this is the first uh, in a series. Oh, do, uh, do you have another? Uh, yeah, before you have, before you close it off, can I just read a quote? I just yes, heard this please. and it's kind of knocked my socks off. Uh, some of you know Aurora Levens Morales. Uh, she's a fabulous writer, activist, you know, all of that. Um, and I read something she wrote the other day, and she says, and I'm reading this to you all in this group because I know you are audacious, right? And I know you can be even more audacious and outrageous, right? So she says, to live a lifetime of audacity dwelling in the place where joy meets justice year after year can only be sustained by being so in love with the vision of what's possible that we can no longer flirt with despair. Wow. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. I'm sure that many of us uh, felt down in the past uh, day, week, month, or more. Thank you for, for sharing that and uh, for uh, inspiring us to be bold, audacious, to organize, uh, for uh, to feel more human ourselves and to uh, join with uh, the rest of humanity. And wow, thank you so much for sharing that quote. I feel like it encapsulates so much of what both of you said uh, in encouraging us um, uh, to uh, be our boldest, uh, most powerful selves, uh, to organize for uh, this, you know, material 
materially for this moment and then also just more broadly uh, for the long term. Uh, so really, thank you so much, so much for joining us. Uh, and sharing uh, your uh, incredible uh, context and helping us peel back these layers and bridge uh, and bridge uh, the uh, these movements for uh, global solidarity, uh, for uh, ending racial capitalism, for ending uh, heteropatriarchy, and more. Um, so this is the first in a series of conversations with movement elders that's being presented by the Socialist Majority Caucus of DSA. Uh, if you are not yet a member of the Socialist Majority Caucus, you can uh, check out our principles uh, and what we're up to um, at socialistmajority.com and check out our blog, um, The Agitator. Uh, we also have an all-caucus call on April on Monday, April 20th at 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Uh, Pacific. We so uh, hope to uh, join all of you in the future. Uh, uh, this is not a moment to despair. This is a time to be audacious. Uh, thank you for joining us, everyone. Uh, and let's let's hang in there, and uh, we will make it through this moment and uh, emerge into a world that is more just, where uh, we will end racial capitalism and we'll be able to uh, uh, enjoy a world that is uh, uh, that is ours. So thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Take care, everyone. Stay safe. Stay well. Uh, stay healthy. Stay healthy. Stay healthy. Max, we have to stop meeting like this. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll meet in the coffee shop as soon as shelter in place is is okay. is, is back on. It's a date. It's a See date. See you soon, Margo. Yeah, thank, thank you. Everybody. Thank you, Beth. Thank you, Hannah. Thank you, okay. Sam. Thank right? You. Is it Sam? Thanks, all. Yes, yes, yes. Sorry, go yeah. Sam. Night, thank everybody. you. All right. Thank you so much. <laughs> Okay, bye. bye everyone. Thank you. Bye, thanks everyone.